Stop bouncing, please. No, I'm just shaking all my equipment. Not Collect for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. O God, who has prepared for them that love thee such good things as past man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward thee that we, loving you above all other things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all we can desire or imagine. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 4 of this muscular. 19th century hymn on what Christian soldiers verse 3 like a mighty army moves the church of God Christians we are treading where the saints have trod we are not divided all one body we one in hope and doctrine one in charity onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before from the crusaders as they march eastwards <laughs> well we like the church is militant and it has to fight and we are in a battle up our eyeballs and we got the dark ages plowing down on us with nihilists and ignorant ignoramuses and biblical illiterates bowing down to their idols well we're on chapter four of progress in Zurich in Switzerland under Oikel and Pottis and Bullinger. And we must say there was a fair handling of Zurich, um, I'm sorry, of Ulrich Zwingli. Um, he emerges as a scholar, an early reformer, a man with political commitments, of course. He dies on a field of battle. He likes music. Again, it's his scholarship that we, you know, he had to face, you know, Martin Luther colloquy. We covered that too. Oita Lampadius and Bullinger. Um, Bullinger will be the one whom it was said when he died, England died, which is an overstatement, but Heinrich was very influential on the Englishman. And the last chapter was centered on the career of Zwingli and his work as it affected the canton of Zurich. His life was lived under high pressure and it was cut off before he or others could measure his achievement or judge whether it would endure. Meanwhile, under the reliable leadership of men who were in touch with him, the Reformation had been advancing in other parts of Switzerland. These men, these were men who had been drawn into the sphere of Zwingli's influence, but they were not his converts or disciples. Some of them, indeed, had been affirming or preaching scriptural versus hierarchical authority and stoutly assailing medieval abuses before Luther or Zwingli became famous. John Wycliffe in England. They had adopted these positions, like Zwingli himself, under the influence of Christian humanists, particularly Erasmus. But the ecclesiastically indeterminate humanist reform ideal fell short of satisfying them. Uh, can you pull the uh, sofa out from the desk? Yeah, thank you. You're Left behind as they pursued their study of the Bible, the bolder programs of Luther and Zwingli called forth their general approval. Since in experience and training they had much in common with Zwingli, they found many of their own thoughts reflected in his teachings. Most of them were fascinated by his brilliance and boldness. Although Caspar Hedio played little part in the Swiss Reformation, his adherence to Zwingli is typical of that of many of the awakened and scholarly clerics. Again, we want to <clears throat> stress once again the Reformation is an intellectual movement, and we must have the same thing again today among intellectuals. They must lead the battle, not the uneducated, but the scholarly. It's always the man who reads who will lead. If you don't read, you'll be led. And the Proverbs over and over again tell us to be men of learning and men of reading, and men of wisdom. 
At Whit Sunday 1518, Hedio, already a Basel doctor of divinity, see what I'm talking about? Visited Ein Seedel and heard Zwingli preach on the story of the paralytic in Luke 5. He was completely captivated. He described the preacher's masterfully presentation of the forgiveness of sins as beautiful, thorough, solemn, comprehensive, penetrating, evangelical. That's a commentary on Zwingli. That tells you something. There's a letter of reference. Again, the Lutherans bash Zwingli all the time, and even some of the Tractarian Anglicans, you know, on the real absence of Christ in the Lord's Supper, all that silly nonsense like Ray, Ray Sutton, Raymond Sutton, a bishop in Dallas of the reform, deformed Episcopal Church, he, he helped to deform it, mocking all of the old Reformed Episcopalians or humble, godly people. This little nitwit Baptist boy from Kentucky, I call him, to make a big splash and get, get some affirmation. He says goofy stuff. Enough. Let's get back to Zwingli. Very nice resume on Zwingli there by a doctor of theology. He felt as if he'd been listening to one of the early church fathers. It is not evident that Hadio's mind was changed. Rather, he was immensely gratified and confirmed in judgments already formed. It was thus with most of those who became Zwingli's colleagues in reform. Oswald Myconius was a self-effacing man with great capacity for appreciation of others. The object of his admiration changed from Erasmus to Zwingli, and he moved with Zwingli from humanism to reform. Wolfgang Kopfel, known as Capito, another Erasmian, and Johann Husken, Oikolampadius, whose humanist teachers were Ruklin, the great Hebrew scholar, and Wilhelming, were biblical humanists who, so to speak, voted for the Reformation. Tom Wittenbach, whose early as 1505, magnified the evangelical points of Erasmus's teaching. We might throw into the mix John Collet in London, preaching at St. Paul's from the Book of Romans in the Greek text. He was almost, he was veering toward Reformation too. We need to kind of keep an eye on John Collet <clears> on <throat> the English side. The authority of scripture, faith, and the reconciling work of Christ later showed a disposition to active reform like that of his own pupils, Zwingli and Ju Judah. As pastor of Beale, 1507 to 26, with an interval at Bern, 1519 to 20, he promoted the Reformation. Conrad Kushner, Pelicanus, learned much from Pico when in Italy and thereafter naturally associated with him, with the workers for reform in Switzerland. Vadianus moves similarly. These are all great names. Again. <laughs> Waiting for further exposition. None of these men, it appears, pass through anything like the throes of Luther's inner struggle or felt a sudden conversion after stubborn resistance such as Calvin was to experience. They did not, like Luther, publicly quarrel with Erasmus or other humanists. They graduated from Christian humanism to Zwinglian Protestantism, extending rather and basically revising their theology and translating thought into action. The Bible studiously consulted, often in the light of the church fathers, in whom they delighted, rather than frame any frame of any theological system shaped their message. The relatively slight inner anxiety of Oikolampadius, stressed by E. Stalhain, scarcely constitutes an exception to this. The one among them who underwent a specific conversion was Zwingli's successor, Heinrich Bullinger, and apparently no Swiss or other reformers' influence 
had as much to do with this experience. Capito, 1478 to 1541, and Oikolampadius, 1482 to 1531, dies the same year as Zwingli, were the beginners of the Reformation in Basel. The son of a blacksmith of Hagenau, Capito was trained in Sforzheim, Ingolstadt, and Freiburg, and was qualified in medicine, law, and theology. His scriptural condemnation of traditional practices began about 1512 when he became pastor of Bruchgal near Tübingen. In that year, Pelican and he discussed approvingly together the spiritual concept of the Lord's Supper before Zwingli now. And of course, this is not brand new. We're thinking of Berto Ratramnus of Corby as well as the Bishop of Northern England. Uh, what was his name? Elf. So Bishop Elfric, drawing a blank. But there was a stream of Reformed thought. Of course, the Wycliffians and the Valdensians, they don't get enough press because the selectivity of the historians have largely airbrushed them out. Archbishop Matthew Parker had a deep appreciation for that stream. But here you got 1512, and they're reading the Bible. So it says, I, this is my body, hocus may, corpus meum. They understand what is, is. And they read, I am the door to the gate that the sheep come in by. It doesn't mean it's the hinges. They understand I am in a figurative sense. I am the vine doesn't mean he's a raspberry bush out there. Got raspberry bushes this year. You get my point. Anyways, this, that's a fascinating point. About the same time Capito met and formed an enduring friendship with Oikolampadius, with whom he was to be briefly associated at Heidelberg and Basel. He taught and preached at Basel for four years, 1515 to 19. Well, uh, that's ahead of Cranmer, isn't it? Grandmer in 1519 is a 30 year old. He's just finishing his Bachelor of Divinity, probably. 1521 is our guess. Introduced slight changes in the worship at the cathedral and prepared his hearers for more fundamental reforms. Capito was appointed chaplain to Albert of Mainz, but since Luther, he broke this connection in 1522. His reputation as a reformer rests on his work in Strasbourg, 1523 to 41, where he cooperated with Bucer, whom Luther called the chatterbox, and whom I say has too much paper. And I'm not the only one who, Bucer is one of those guys who just has a need to talk all the time, kind of like yours truly in a way. But he wrote these complex, verbose, whatever. But Cranmer liked him, and he was influential in fixing the prayer book. All those Puritans like Cranmer. Mr. Con Cranmer, a Puritan, just to irritate the Tractarian types who think Puritans were something they had to deal with. But the labeling and naming and the branding stuff is something we're more and more interested in. Okay, back to Booser. Maintain good relations with the Swiss. The more radical innovator, later an Anabaptist, Wilhelm Rubli, having zealously attacked the mass of purgatory, was banished from Basel in 1520 year, 22, the year in which Lampadius began his permanent residence there. This gifted man was born at Wiensburg in Württemberg of a well-to-do family named Husken, family name which is variously dispelled as a diminutive of the word house, but the learned form he adopted, oiko lampadius, means a house of light, or the house lamp. To satisfy his father's wish that he should study law, he attended the University of Bologna, or Bologna, but he turned to theology and the languages, continued his work in German universities. At Heidelberg, he was stimulated by Ruklin, the Hebrew scholar, where he ultimately rivaled whom he ultimately rivaled as a master of Hebrew. That's a tough order. 
at Tübingen. He felt strongly the influence of Wittenbach made the acquaintance of Melanchthon and Capito. Again, this is an intellectual movement going on. Oh, God, may we have that at, among intellectuals today. Let's not be ashamed of doing that, calling out this, that, and the other, and being men of integrity, and women, too. The presence there of Erasmus, then preparing, well, Erasmus is not a favorite here. He's a sycophant, a quarter, courtier type. He put a publication in the New Testament in Greek, that was 1516, <clears throat> it was one of the attractions of the post for Oikel Empadius. He proved a helpful assistant in the final stage of this work and was closely attached to Erasmus, although he never completely became a disciple of the Dutch humanist. The office of penitentiary, which gave him supervision over cases of penance, led to his close study of patristic texts on the subject, some of which he translated, and he went on to read extensively in the Church Fathers. He was of an earnest reforming temper. He denounced in pulpit and print the customary risus pascalis, or the unseemly ludicrous tales introduced in Easter services. He was soon called away to Augsburg, and somewhat unsettled by the Luther controversy, he sought opportunity for study by entering into the Brigantine Monastery at Altomunster, near that city, in April 1520. So, okay, the stuff is already heating up in April 1520 with Luther and the Pope. Um, the theses have been nailed on a wall, all kinds of stuff going on. But he'd already become a reader of Luther's treatises and was moving toward the adoption of his views of penance. The monastic brethren charged him with heresy, but allowed him to avoid arrest and ride away with an armed band of protectors in January 1522. For a brief period, he was in the company of Franz von Sickingen, leader of the Knights whose revolt was about to begin. In November 1522, he arrived in Basel, accompanied by Ulrich von Houten, who, as we have seen, was obliged to depart for Zurich because of Erasmus's hostility. Oikolampadius, or the house lamp, was at this period in friendly correspondence with Luther. It was to him that Luther wrote his celebrated comment on Erasmus, that he would die like Moses in the land of Moab. It was in part through Luther's influence that Oikolampadius moved away from Erasmus and Moab into the promised land of the Reformation, yet he was not to be drawn into the circle of Luther's disciples. Back in Basel, he was made preacher in the Church of St. Martin's and lecturer in theology at the university. He now began to cultivate the friendship of Zwingli and the press for reform. His alliance with Erasmus was severed, and some of his university colleagues were unfavorable to his teaching. He enjoyed the confidence of Conrad Pelican, who taught Hebrew, and suffered with him the suspicion of the conservatives. When the latter became hostile, the city council, which by charter controlled the university, dismissed the objectors and promoted Oikolampadius and Pelican to full professorships. In 1523, the feudal authority of the bishop, which before the Reformation had been progressively reduced, was finally extinguished, and the aging Chris, Christoph von Utenheim removed the Episcopal residence from the city. The preaching of scripture doctrines was free changes in the services were cautiously introduced, including the use of German language and singing and in the service of baptism. In 1524, a priest of the canton of Basel, who had married, posted in the university and elsewhere, five theses against the prohibition of clerical marriage. Nobody came forward to dispute with him. The Basel Franciscans on the refusal to substitute sermons for masses were deprived of their income by the action of the magistrates. 
This is why they'll call it a magisterial reformation uh, as opposed to ministerial. Magisterial, that it was driven by the magistrates like in the cities and the cantons and like even Calvin had to submit to in Geneva and of course poor Cranmer with that crowd up there in England. When he was facing all kinds of forces, the whole Tudor engine he was living in. Anyways, the printing houses of Basel were issuing much Reformation literature. They print everything favorable to Luther, said Erasmus in 1523, and nothing in favor of the Pope. It's well to notice that there was a hundred years preceding this of substantial desires at the top levels for Reformation in the Church of Rome it was known by lots of aristocrats and nobles. They saw the corruption. They saw the games. They knew the politics. And I'm looking forward, God willing, one day to rereading uh, Charles Hardwick on the 39 Articles. And he has an exquisite chapter on the 14th and 15th centuries. And he outlines some of the 15th century efforts at reform that never came to a whole lot, a lot of talk, no action. But it's a very good scholarly deliberative piece by that Anglican man. And as Dad used to say, those Anglicans, they've got some good scholars. <laughs> what did I know when I was eight or 10 years old? I just wanted to go and play baseball. Anglican, oh, they've got some good scholars. He and he liked that. He approved of it. He loved his Anglican chaplain in the Royal Canadian Navy. Oh, man. I guess after the war, he traveled around with them a little bit, the churches. They did evening services. People wanted to hear, you know, from homecoming veterans of World War II. And the Anglican chaplain took several old sailors around traveling through Ontario, around Ontario. <sighs> Didn't stop Dad from going to a Presbyterian college, though. Um, at this period, uh, beginning, I don't understand that either. My grandfather was raised Anglican, turned Presbyterian. I don't know why. Who knows? At this period, a beginning was also made in Bern. Here, a talented poet, Nicholas Manuel, died in 1530, aroused public interest in reform, especially by his satirical plays. In 1523, at the carnival, two of these were enacted, in which the Pope and the hierarchy were vigorously attacked. In one, Manuel contrasted Christ, crowned with thorns and riding on an ass, followed by the humble afflicted, with the Pope splendidly mounted and armed, surrounded by military weapons, trumpets and drums, and attended by soldiers and camp followers. Oh, <laughs> humor sometimes teaches the serious stuff. That's funny. And they, had, they would do that stuff up at Oxford. There's some uh, satire, satirical plays that were even sponsored as propaganda pieces. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but got to laugh a little, said Grandma. The leader of the reform in Bern was Bert Hall, Haller. We got a city just up 30 miles north. It was called New Bern, formed, founded by, I suppose, uh, uh, Swiss people, although this was, uh, North Carolina was part of the holdings of Charles II. In fact, some of the land grants to some of the early families around here were from Charles. They're still down on the books, down in the county. Uh, in 1520, he succeeded Wittenbach as priest of St. Vincent's in Bern. In 1521, he visited Zwingli and formed with him an enduring alliance. There's a lot of action going on in Switzerland. Uh, it's never got enough play whatsoever in courses that I had on this. I was talking with my wife about it this morning. I had a lot of schooling, but well, yeah, but you know, you go from university and your graduate programs and it zip, zip, zip along, you can't get everything. 
this is a fantastic book. I do recommend it. And you know, I'm valiant and bold to say books I don't recommend. I, it takes me a while to come to that. This uh, We're about 10% in, and this is looking good. This is looking really good. It's giving me a new appreciation for the Swiss. They're, they're a long way along. In tandem, right alongside Luther, with their own uniquenesses. In fact, they're ahead of the English. We're talking 1520s here. Yeah, they had some proto-reformers like Tyndall and Latimer and Frith and others, but there was a very repressive regime in the 1520s in England, led by Sir Thomas More, Henry himself, John Fisher was vicious, Bishop of Rochester, the normally calm, deliberative, scholarly man became a viper. Even Tom Cranmer in 1528 just said he's over the top in his rhetoric, and he likened him to Luther, whom he Cranmer thought Luther was over the top in his rhetoric, which he was. <clears throat> and Sir Thomas More has some passages, the deliberative lawyer, man, no longer is he speaking with forked tongue, he's coming out with daggers. That stuff would be worth reading again, enough to silence and chill anybody from challenging them, which was the idea. But it actually had the opposite effect because it stimulated people, what's going on around here? And that was Cranmer included. He lacked the valiant spirit of Zwingli, and when he became discouraged by opposition, it was Zwingli's exhortation that held him to the task. He summoned new resolution and remained active in Bern, a firm contender for the Reformation and guide to the Reformed Church until his death in 1536. Haller was aided by the support of a distinguished Bernese family, the Devot Vautvilles of whom Jacob was the presiding magistrate, while his son Nicholas was provost of the Church of Bern and had been thought of as a probable successor to the Bishop of La Suane. I think it was the Bishop of La Suane. They elected the guy, and they elected him because he only had six illegitimate children compared to his competitor who had nine. <laughs> so much for the vow of celibacy, huh? They, they knew. They knew the stuff was up, turned the other way. And they turned it into a moneymaker. The bishop knew you had a wife and kids. You had to pay an annual premium for a dispensation, kind of like an insurance policy. <laughs> what a, you know, unbelievable. Well, let's see here. I think this is what we'll call it a day on the Swiss Reformation. We didn't make a lot of progress. I was talking a little bit too much. But we'll end with a prayer and with this Victor 19th century Victorian hymn, Muscular Christianity. Crowns and thro thrones may perish. Kingdoms rise and wane. But the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against the church prevail. We have Christ's own promise and that cannot fail. Hallelujah to that. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Until next time, Godspeed. Grandpa? Yeah.